Hi everyone, imagine being able to recall every memory in vivid detail, communicate telepathically, or see through someone else's eyes. It sounds like science fiction, but these are just some of the superpowers that may become possible by leveraging the technology of brain-computer interfaces. Intrigued? Ready to learn more about this extraordinary new paradigm? Let's dive right in. This video will have three sections. What are brain-computer interfaces? What are the new abilities you can get with BCIs? And societal implications. Let's first talk about computer interfaces you might be more familiar with. Computers have keyboards and mice, which are considered input interfaces because they allow you to provide information to the computer. Screens or monitors are also considered interfaces. They're output interfaces because they allow the computer to provide information to you. Brain-computer interfaces allow more direct communication between your brain and a computer without having to go through muscle movements or your eyes. Brain-computer interfaces, or BCIs, also come in both input and output forms, though they're usually described as centric to your own brain. Like, an input BCI allows a computer to provide information to your brain, and an output BCI allows your brain to provide information to the world. Some BCIs are external, like skull caps or something that you wear on the outside of your head. Some are internal, like brain implants, essentially. Making a BCI is a really hard problem that involves expertise in computer science, data science, neuroscience, as well as hardware engineering, just to name a few. There have been a number of research prototypes of BCIs that are mostly targeted at people with certain health conditions, like cerebral palsy, for example, but there are also commercial solutions that are starting to become available. You might have heard of Neuralink, which is Elon Musk's brain implant company. Neuralink has been developing an implant that has to be surgically inserted into your brain and which connects directly to some neurons in your brain. There have been some problems with this technique though because the brain doesn't really like foreign matter touching it and Neuralink has yet to receive the go-ahead from the FDA to conduct human trials. Another company with a very promising product is called Synchron. The company was founded primarily by neuroscientists rather than engineers, so they took a different approach. Synchron's product was designed to be as non-invasive as possible, so instead of involving a direct brain implant, they actually put a fine mesh of sensors within the blood vessels that go within your brain. Your bloodstream is more forgiving to having foreign objects inside it, which is why we can provide heart implants, for example. It's a pretty clever way of getting very close to your brain without actually getting inside it. That's not to say it's easy, though. The procedure involves embedding a device within your chest, which then has wires feeding up through the jugular vein in your neck to reach your brain. So yes, obviously not something you want to do lightly, but Synquin's product has actually been embedded in humans, and someone even used it to send a tweet. The information being read from your brain is then actually sent to this device in your chest, which then connects via Bluetooth to any other device that you choose. About a month ago, there was also some very exciting new research that came out of Hoot Lab at the University of Texas in Austin. The researchers decided to use an MRI machine to read people's brains from the outside. The main hurdle that they had to overcome was that an MRI machine, although it has very good spatial accuracy, has about 10 seconds lag when it's reading the whole brain. So you're going to get 10 seconds worth of someone's thoughts all jumbled up together. And when you look at the areas of the brain that get activated, it could be pretty hard to figure out what those different thoughts were. So what the researchers did was they had volunteers lie within an MRI machine for a total of 16 hours. It probably wasn't all at once. And during that time, volunteers would watch movies and read text and have their brains scanned continuously. The researchers were then able to take those brain scans and train a GPT model, actually based on GPT-1, to create a very custom model for each person that mapped certain brain activity to certain video frames. And because they knew the text of what was being said or displayed on the screen at that time, they were able to map that to a known sentence that the volunteer was actually thinking. They had about 6,000 words in the end. After that, they were able to take the volunteers and get them to listen to speech, and then they could actually read the brain signals at that time to form a text-based representation of what that person was listening to. It also worked for output, in other words, if the person were to just imagine themselves speaking, the MRI machine was able to pick up those brain signals and they were also able to generate a text transcript of what that person was envisioning themselves saying. That's as close to actual mind reading as I've ever heard. The researchers are literally taking entire sentences and lifting them out of someone's brain. It's comparable to the accuracy that really good language models get when they translate from English to German, according to the BERT score metric. The models seem to have trouble picking up pronouns and would often word things in slightly different ways. So it's a little bit fuzzy, but it's really amazing that it works so well. 
For context, current systems, both research prototypes and commercial systems, would typically allow someone to pick between a small number of options, maybe a hundred at most, because they really require the user to concentrate pretty hard on something. And if you want to produce a message, you have to piece together a lot of different tokens. So you might get one or 10 words per minute at most. This new research prototype was trained on more than 6,000 words, and those are therefore the words that it could recognize. And speech, which they were tracking, is between 100 and 130 words per minute on average, faster if you're a YouTuber. So that's a brief summary of where brain-computer interfaces are today. Second section, new abilities enabled by brain-computer interfaces. As you might have gathered, BCI research has primarily been focused on people with health conditions. For example, someone who's unable to speak properly, like Stephen Hawking, might want to use a brain-computer interface to produce output. Or perhaps someone who's unable to use their hands or doesn't have accurate fine motor control might want to use a brain-computer interface, again, to produce intelligible output. Since I also have health issues with my hands, that's why I wear these gloves, it is something, a line of research that I follow with interest. In the future, BCIs might also be used for people, for example, who are unable to form new memories. However, in addition to restoring people's abilities to where they might have once been, this technology will eventually benefit everyone. It will grant people a lot of new abilities. For example, motor control of smart devices, for example, doors and lights, or prosthetic arms. There was actually one paper where a monkey was controlling a robotic arm completely via a brain-computer interface, and the researchers said it was sort of like telekinesis, witnessing this monkey manipulating things from across the room. So that's an output example, but in terms of input to your brain, a BCI would be able to give you new senses. For example, infrared vision or the ability to hear digital news feeds. It reminds me a bit of those little magnets that you can actually get implanted into your finger. I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but I had a friend who did it, and the magnet is basically attached to the end of a nerve, which is painful at first, but after a while, you effectively gain a sixth sense because as you walk around and the magnet is attracted to magnetic fields or to metal, you can actually sense it moving around because it touches and moves the nerve. And you learn to use that as a sort of detection for magnetic fields that exist around you. And of course, that's a very primitive example that's just repurposing one nerve that already exists inside your finger. But that's just scratching the surface of what we'd be able to do with a direct brain-computer interface. Of course, memory is a big one too. The ability for your brain to put information through the brain-computer interface and have it stored electronically so that it can be fetched whenever your brain wants it is amazing. That would give you perfect recall of memories, for example. Extremely fast search through all your memories. It's sort of like how right now I might write down some information on my phone and then remember where I put it on my phone instead of remembering all the bits of the information. That's just my brain remembering an indirection to where the information is actually stored. This would probably work the same way where your brain could remember that it's actually stored on the external storage device and then go and fetch the information from there. It might even be completely seamless, especially if you receive the BCI at a young age. Of course, once your information and your memories are digital, that opens up a lot of possibilities. For example, you could probably do brain-to-brain -brain transfer of information. Of course, it's unclear how similar people's brains are to each other in terms of how they actually store memory. Probably not that similar, but the information could be encoded in a lingua franca, which is to say the natural language like English that you already speak. This would effectively enable telepathy, the ability to communicate with someone else brain to brain with no words being spoken. It might let you share memories as well and do all kinds of other things. Again, I imagine if you received the BCI device from a very young age, you would probably adapt very well to this sort of external storage of memories, sort of the way that a digital native right now can use computers well. And finally, this sort of external transfer of memories would allow new information to be learned extremely rapidly. For example, you could just copy information to your external storage, and then all you have to do is tell your brain that that information is now there, which, if your brain gets used to querying the external storage for searching, means that the storage device could tell your brain whether there is something there or not. So this would allow Google by thought, it would also allow you to download new skills, essentially, and learn with extreme rapidity. You could probably translate between languages very rapidly, perhaps even in real time as you're listening to someone else speak. I mean, the possibilities are endless. It really opens up a discussion of what does it really mean to be human at that point? And the answer is, well, you would be a human machine hybrid, which we already are with smartphones because we rely on them for a lot of purposes. This would just be a very high bandwidth and very low latency connection. Your brain can directly transfer information out and have information transferred in. And again, it doesn't have to go through your fingers and your eyes and so on when you're using a smartphone. So the third part, what are the societal implications of all this? Well, first I think virtual reality and augmented reality, which is the real world, but just has some extra virtual elements in it. I think the boundary between those would get really blurred especially if you actually eventually have the ability to shut down your external senses and instead have digital equivalents coming in. To me, that seems very far off, but the idea is, of course, being explored in science fiction already, 
with the nerve gear from Sword Art Online that would completely disconnect you from the real world and catapult you into a virtual one. The major plot line of that, if you haven't seen it or read it, is that people get isolated from their bodies and can't come back. Again, who knows how possible that would actually be, but obviously there's a huge can of worms when you start using these types of technologies. There are tons of privacy implications for this technology as well, because your own personal thoughts are potentially accessible by third parties. The corporations that provide you the BCI devices might have access to that data, which they could then harvest and use for advertising and all sorts of other purposes. I mean, currently we already have phones that eavesdrop on our speech and provide ads to us. Imagine how much worse it would be if something can actually read your thoughts and then take steps that may not be in your best interest based on that. There's lots of legal ramifications as well of BCI technologies. For example, right now, police need a warrant in order to search private property. And when someone invented infrared scanners that allowed police to see into buildings to determine if people were home, for example, that right had to be revisited. And eventually the Supreme Court in the US said that that was not allowed for police to do that. So with BCIs, it's effectively a lie detector on steroids, right? Not only can you detect if someone's lying or not, you can probably read the thoughts that they are trying not to expose to you unless someone is very, very good at not thinking about the thing that they're trying to hide. I should mention that at least the current generation of these BCI technologies are very easy to confuse if the person whose brain is being read doesn't want to have it be read. For example, you can mess up the training in that research study by thinking about other things and so on, but it's not clear whether future technologies would have those same limitations. And finally, there are the ethical considerations, which I won't go into here. Or imagine someone's thoughts being used against them because they're easily accessible. Right now, the right to thought is considered basically absolute because no one can detect that right now, and we're assumed to have privacy within our own minds. But that might change. In conclusion, brain-computer interfaces are fast becoming reality. There are already research prototypes, a handful of commercial ventures, and exciting new research results on the horizon as well. BCIs will enable many new abilities, including electronic memory, new senses, and telepathy, brain-to-brain -brain communication. I think it will lead to a lot of societal change as well as we start to become human-machine hybrids. It's an exciting milestone on our way to the technological singularity. If you're still not convinced that brain-computer interfaces could enable some of the things that I've mentioned, I suggest you check out this video here where I talk about why no one saw ChatGPT coming. Alright, that's all I have for today. Thanks very much for watching. Bye.